Hi, folks. Hi, folks. I'm Tina Hui with Follow the Coin, and we're here with Tim Swanson. I, you know what? I know you've authored a couple of things, Tim, but I really want you to be the one to introduce yourself. Ah, so kind. I get to uh, give myself all sorts of titles. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have a, a couple of small books I wrote about uh, the cryptocurrency space. Uh, most recently, I guess people know me primarily because I, I was working at a company called R3, or was head of market research. Uh, and as a result, I ended up meeting lots of different companies. Uh, and I actually recently left there. I'm still an advisor with them, um, but I've set up my own advisory company out here in the Bay Area and working with primarily on the enterprise side, but also have a couple of clients doing things with cryptocurrency. So uh, I'm still around, still writing and, and enjoying, uh, enjoying my barrels of popcorn at this stage. It's no longer bowls, it's barrels. Well, why is it barrels versus bowls? Uh, because there's so much more buttery goodness going on. You have, it looks like every week, uh, some crazy ICO that is finally, you know, uncovered that, you know, like it was the New York Times article on, it was a Centra or yeah, Centra card. They found out that the uh, the founders, a couple of the founders, had uh, legal problems that they hadn't disclosed. Um, you have I won't mention other specific ICOs, but you have some now that are um, having a potential class action lawsuits. Uh, maybe those don't get certified as actual lawsuits. But bottom line is, you you after a year of mania, if not more, you you finally have adults coming in and saying, hey, you you aren't actually delivering what you promised or you didn't disclose certain things. So, I mean, we, we could talk all day long about ICOs and like pre-sales and things like that and, 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 and how uh, they're not disclosing anything to the, the actual retail investors about, you know, the structured discounts that they get. But happy to happy to talk about enterprise side too. So we, we, we can do it all today if you'd, like, if you'd like, Tina. Let's go ahead and do so. It's been a while since we last talked. I can't even, I think it's been at least two and a year and a half. And uh, we were just saying earlier, a lot of us went on hiatus and we're back. And um, yeah, I want to know everything about, you know, what you've been up to. And actually on the topic of ICOs that are kind of sketchy, what ways can you tell that an ICO is a good ICO and which is bad? Wow. So uh, I actually don't know if there's such thing as really a good ICO. It's almost an oxymoron at this stage. Uh, maybe there's a way you can do it. Um, because look, generally speaking, ICOs are done in order to avoid some kind of law, either, either filing laws that they don't want to go through because crowdfunding itself has been around for a while. Um, the reason it's become extra popular is because you could, you could take these you know, coins and dump them on a secondary market and not have any recourse in case something bad happens. It's really difficult to, to pay people down. Um, but there are a couple of law firms out there that are trying to actually go by the book, as it were, um, and saying, hey, if you're, if you're actually trying to structure these as a, as a security, we could obviously, there's already good securities frameworks that we could, we could do that under. Uh, obviously, if you go through that actual route, um, you end up limiting, number one, who you could solicit to. Um, and number two, uh, on the secondary market, uh, who could be trade, who has access to trading this. In the U.S., there's about 3% of the Americans are, are considered a quote-unquote accredited investors, capable or allowed to invest in some of these types of securities. Um, so it, that would, if, if you went that route, you would dra dramatically reduce the amount of participants, potential participants. Um, now, if you try to go a different route, you know, everyone's talking about some kind of utility token. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so please do not take anything I'm saying as actual legal advice. Go out talk to some real lawyers. Um, the, you know, the buzzword right now, it, it, all these events and meetups and conferences is, oh, uh, we've, we're releasing a utility token. It's going to be, it's going to be exempt from SEC, you know, regs. Uh, that's fine and dandy, but you still could be compliant. You still need to be compliant with say, um, AML requirements. So money laundering, making sure nobody's moving illicit funds, sanctions list. I don't know of a single ICO. Uh, well, that's not true. Maybe, maybe there's one or two that did, did KYC that, that actually did do background checks, but but there's a sanctions list that, uh, in the U.S. in which it's not just countries, it's not just you know, if you're from North Korea, it's specific people that are sanctioned. Um, and so you're supposed to go through and make sure that you didn't either receive money from uh, those types of people or that you didn't end up you know, benefiting them somehow in which you, you gave them points on the other side. So, um, and then there's like, I have a whole, I have a draft of like the 10 reasons that you probably screwed up with your ICO. I haven't, I haven't published it yet, but those are some of them. Um, you also have FinCEN requirements. If you issue and you redeem a, a token, you can be considered a money transmitter. So uh, some of these ERC-20 tokens um, that are being uh, you know, basically thrown out there in the world, uh, some of the people that do this you know, centralization uh, process, you're really setting yourself up for a target, not just for SEC regs or CFTC or whatever, but all the money transmitter things that people have been talking about for three, four, five years now. So 
Um, yeah, we, we could dive into all those. Happy to obviously loop in anyone in the audience, the actual lawyers that, that it would hopefully give you good advice. Uh, I, I actually think there are a number of good ones, but same time, there's also people who probably giving you bad advice too. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a doctor, right? You want to make sure you get second, second and third opinions before you have a brain surgery. Right. I know it's kind of scary out there right now, like which law firms are actually doing legitimate guidance and which ones are actually just sort of seeing that they have SEC officers or like compliance and they don't really know what they're doing. And that goes with the ICOs, goes with any company. I mean, outside of Bitcoin even, right? Like sometimes even startups are kind of in question. However, the thing that baffles me a little bit is um, it always feels like people forget that this is, it's called FinTech for a reason. The finance side means it comes with a lot of regulations and you have to be compliant, right? Um, there's, if, yes, everybody wants to be decentralized. Yes, I, we understand we kind of want to have a new money system and everything like that, but there's no way around the fact that there's going to be financial regulation with working with different countries and governments and controls and money is a very hard place to disrupt, right? So if you could talk to some, I've been talking to, so I'd like to call it sometimes the new age uh, ICOs, the last two years people have come on board, it seems like Bitcoin 2.0, right? And in this Bitcoin 2.0, it's almost a little bit of a frenzy. And um, it's hard to talk to people and say, you know what, we know people who got in trouble. They've been, you know, investigated, they've gone to jail, they've been fined, they've been sued, they've gone bankrupt, so quote unquote. We can't just take the money and run. And so, I don't know, do you have any guidance for people in the new phase, I know you just gave a talk at Berkeley, uh, I think this week. And what was that talk about? How was that? How was the atmosphere of the room? Yeah, so that, that actually ties in exactly with what you were talking about. The, the topic was uh, code is not law. And basically I explained some of the same things. Hey, you have, you have governance issues that arise in the cryptocurrency world. Um, and since there's really no on-chain way of resolving that, they, there's all, everyone goes through an off-chain mechanism. They use social media to yell and scream at each other. They create stock pops to yell at each other. Um, and then sometimes they go to court. Uh, so you end up basically recreating or at least reusing the existing system um, and then adding a lot of friction and noise on top of it uh, through this, you know, social media chain effect. You know, everyone's got Twitter accounts yelling at each other, right? Or blocking each other or whatever. Um, so yeah, the Berkeley event was pretty cool. Uh, about 70-ish uh, about 70, people, 75 uh, attendees, I guess. And um, like half and half for students. And one of the funny parts in the q and I, th I think there is a, uh, a video of it, but you don't, you don't want to necessarily listen to like the hour and a half or whatever it was. Uh, it, towards the end, one guy in the back said, uh, "Hey Tim, how do I uh, how do I structure a company in Switzerland such that I don't get extradited?" And you know, my my response to him was like, "Well, you know, if you're if you're going to worry about being extradited like from day one, why why do that business? Like I don't see I don't see why you know this fascination with being a martyr or." or fighting the man is is part and parcel to it. You could be genuinely interested in technology, build a business around it and not have to, you know, fear for your lives of having to wear uh, an orange jumpsuit or whatever, you know, national color <laughs> you end up in, in the different jurisdictions. Uh, so yeah, I mean, my advice is if you're truly wor worried about legal stuff, don't get advice from you know, coin media or, you know, crypto lawyers, go find an actual lawyer who has, you know, real degrees or, or uh, a firm um, that hasn't been shut down or, or <laughs> been debarred, uh, and, and hire and pay the money and, and go through that process. I know. I know that you know. There's a lot of people who think that lawyers and laws will be displaced or should be ignored. You go ahead and try that. But at the end of the day, you know, regulators and law enforcement have budgets. They they might not get to catch everybody, but uh, you know, they have statute of limitations that are sometimes long. They have long arms. They could. Like, I'll give you an example. BTCE was uh, was recently shut down a few months ago. Uh, for those who don't know, BTCE was a popular exchange uh, for basically moving illicit proceeds because you didn't have to do any KYC or AML. Um, and they were effectively shut down. The There was, a, I guess, a raid, um, AKA they, they got a hold of the servers, but they also caught some people that were supposedly, allegedly running it, uh, some Russian guy that was vacationing in Greece or something like that. Um, but it was interesting. If you look at the, the the authorities of who claim to have jurisdiction, the Northern California District Court, or the, yeah, the, the, that area, uh, it was Catherine Hahn's team um, that claimed jurisdiction. Yet there was about six billion dollars of stuff uh, laundered. So how did how did California or the this specific federal court or federal district uh, court 
have jurisdiction over something that wasn't domiciled either in the U.S. or the people running it were in the U.S. Want to know? If you read through the the complaint, and again, this hasn't actually gone through you know the court process itself. They they found that uh, about a, I think it was about two hundred three hundred thousand dollars worth of money was trying to be or was actually moved through Trade Hill, which was an exchange based in San Francisco in 2013. Again, I, I don't know what the actual mechanics of that were, but th they identify you know like twelve different transactions that tried to go through that. So hey, that, that's a U.S. exchange uh, run by U.S. residents. That actually, ended up getting shut. You know, I guess they lost their bank accounts and had to shut down, but. That's how the, the long arm of the U.S. works. And other jurisdictions have uh, power, too, it, 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 it seems. So I, I, I would be cautious of trying to do anything in which you think that, uh, without, without even having to talk to lawyers, that you, you could be in trouble for. So again, talk to people who get paid, and that's what their expertise is in. I think the well, here's where the lines get pushy for those who I, I talked to a lot of people who are like, well, but, you know, if we're okay, then we're okay. And I said, yes. However, if you're going to work with other companies and those companies happen to be, I don't know, something like Silk Road and they're doing illicit things and you happen to be somebody who knowingly works with some person knowing that they sometimes take illegal uh, transactions and let them happen, that is actually a jurisdiction for you to be indicted as well, right? Like it's sort of, isn't that sort of something they look at? It's like you still should be checking who your customers are? Yeah, sure. So in fact, I wrote an article, uh, or actually I didn't write the article. I, so I wrote a couple articles on Bitfinex and Tether, and then uh, a former lawyer reached out to me and sent me a note uh, about why he thinks Tether, and again, this is uh, you know speculation, alleged, I don't want to be sued for defamation, but um, when you see exchanges having to hire lots of compliance people, part of that compliance is to look through for suspicious activities and file suspicious activity reports, at least if you're in the U.S., regarding, it's called BSA, uh, the, the Bank Secrecy Act. That's the compliance framework that you, you're supposed to go under. Uh, Ripple was actually sued, they're not sued, they were fined by FinCEN for not, for, for violating a uh, specific BSA requirement uh, back in 2015, May 2015, I think it was. The, the fine came down. So FinCEN in the U.S. does pay attention to. I, again, I don't know how many other exchanges have been, you know, fined. I might. I've, I've hear rumors all the time about exchanges getting hit. So as a result, they bring on compliance folks to provide that kind of um, optics uh, to, in, in compliance, you know, paperwork. I know it sounds messy. It's complete anathema to the cryptocurrency people. But yeah, um, you know, with Tether itself, they do register. They have registered as, uh, you know, through FinCEN. But uh, it's alleged that they probably don't have a compliance team that's filing SARs because you could easily move money at one point between BTCE and Bitfinex, um, uh, effectively, I guess, laundering money, assuming that that's uh, the activity. That's insane. That's funny. Well, yeah, that's an interesting point because um, some people are like, well, it's not money laundering. I'm like, well, but it's not up to you to decide, right? It's also somebody else is going to decide whether or sure, not. Sure, sure. I mean, again, I'm not a a uh, lawyer or a compliance officer, but you know, if you're trying to deceive where that money came from or mix proceeds from a, you know, crimes with that then, or the, or proceeds of crimes, then yeah, that's the kind of stuff that they've looked for. They go after big banks, they find them, they maybe throw people in jail. So, um, you know, if, if they, this is something to take seriously, uh, especially if it has anything to do with uh, human trafficking or terrorism or something like that. And again, I'm not saying that that's, that's what's taking place with, say, Tether or what's happening with BTC. That has to be proved in court and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, you and I, I'm sure, hear quite a few rumors about you know, people trying not to pay taxes. I mean, that's, that's actually probably the first part. That, yeah, the, the easy one that I see a lot is uh, you know, people, people at meetups bragging about, oh, yeah, I did these trades and I'm not paying taxes. I'm like, dude, why, why are you? You're just self-incriminating yourself. Oh, you see this even on, on Twitter. Uh, you know, people say what kind of trades they did, which I guess is okay in the sense that you're actually disclosing the fact that you're doing stuff publicly. You own these assets. But on the other hand, you're also, you know, if one day if the IRS or any of these you know, tax agencies decide to go through and see if you've been paying your taxes, they could just easily either subpoena the information. Uh, and that stuff lives forever, not only on Twitter, but even if they delete it, they, you, you have it stored somewhere uh, in, in the cloud, but potentially even Google's archived it or maybe even archived that is. So, um, yeah, any, obviously, I'm not saying they're going to go after everyone or I'm not trying to <laughs> totally scare people, but um, that's there's regulators are going to regulate because that's what they pay, get paid to do. They're not disappearing. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to play whack-a-mole and hope to, to get away, 
Um, you know, I, I prefer not having to fly around. My, my wife would yell at me, or, or as I joked, if I, if I got thrown in prison, my wife would break into prison just to beat me up. So oh, wow. I, 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 I don't like that, that uh, an angry wife, let alone an angry uh, law enforcement officer. Well, I know she's a really nice lady. It's kind of a crazy world out there. Code is not law is actually kind of a really great uh, tagline, I think, that we would definitely, well, you know what? We're just going to make this also the title of this video because it's like Tim Swanson says, code is not law. I mean, it's well, I mean, if you want, I, mean, I can explain why I actually argue that. Uh, yeah, so part of that is um, I, I originally did that presentation the week after the Ethereum fork um, last year to at an Ethereum meetup. And it was actually, I didn't get pelted with tomatoes, which was nice. Uh, I was expecting, you know, because that community, for, what it's worth, been, uh, for the most part, uh, Ethereum community has been pretty kind to me. I, I know a number of the, I guess, you know, de facto leaders or whatever, and they've, at least they've never threatened to punch me in the face. These, the, not, the, not the single out Bitcoin core folks, but there, plenty of those guys have, have done various threats uh, in the last year. But anyways, yeah, to me and to, to my colleagues and former colleagues and stuff like that. So yeah, anyways, that's, that's neither here nor there. We can find people, negative people in, in, in all these, different, or not even negative. Yeah, the code is not law idea is, is basically the opposite side of what many of the Ethereum people were saying is code is law. Yeah, so you have people saying this code uh, that represents whatever uh, cannot be stopped. It shouldn't be stopped if stopping it is sacrilegious and unholy uh, because everyone uses religious undertones. Um, but uh, the Ethereum network forked uh, to resolve effectively an existential quagmire, right? The, the DAO hacker had access to, at the time, um, it was hundreds of millions of, of dollars today, I suppose. I'd actually have to do the math. But uh, bottom line is, you know, if you have one bank that gets robbed, that rep and had in, that, in that piggy bank was, you know, 10% of, you know, 15% of the money supply of the entire economy being held by this criminal, you know, what would a nation state do? Would they, quote, unquote, fork the currency and, you know, dis discard that those those uh, those numbers. I don't I don't know what they would do, but that's effectively what happened with this, right? They said we're gonna do a mulligan, and you get to withdraw. So you had a, you had a, another element in the community who didn't want the fork. They're saying, yeah, this is something we're gonna have to live with no matter what. Um, and they kind of self-selected themselves out of that community and called themselves Ethereum Classic. Now they just held an event in Hong Kong, I think, the last couple of days. Um, so, I, I, and then you see with the Bitcoin uh, community, they've been trying to do these different types of forks uh, for various scaling purposes. Um, and then you have, you know, within those communities, like the Bitcoin core folks are like, yeah, we, we just can't change this all. We were never going to do a hard fork. Uh, at least we, we, we have no desire to do a hard fork because um, that would destroy, you know, they always use the term immutability, but that's, that's really an improper term. Immutability has to do with actual digital signatures and signing. Um, the proof of work is, is separate to that in, in, in the verification of, of, the, of the blocks and building of the blocks is a separate issue. But anyways, um, so I argue in that presentation effectively that um, because there is no uh, de jure governance, so there's a difference between de jure and de facto. De jure is mean lawful or legitimate. De facto means it just, that's the process uh, that we end up having. Um, so we have de facto processes in all these cryptocurrencies because nobody clearly has, there's no constitution, there's no quote unquote decision maker. And that's by design, because if you do have a decision maker, then number one, they could easily probably make decisions to, to fork or not to fork or make changes unilaterally. Um, but number two, they could actually be potentially shut down. Like the government could say, hey, you're, you're administrating a money transmission network or whatever, we're gonna find you and throw you in jail. Um, so it's a double-edged sword, right? Satoshi, he or she, I, by the way, it was funny, I, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned she in an article recently and I had a lot of people complain saying, we know it's not a she. And I was like, well, you don't know who it is. So you, anyways, I, I'm not gonna weigh in on, on the gender, but bottom line is that uh, the double-edged sword is since you don't have a decision maker, it's much more difficult to, to clearly make a, you know, to come to consensus on any of this. Um, and as a result, you end up with these, these uh, off-chain social media wars. Uh, I made a joke, uh, you know, do we, do we end up with like, campaign ribbons at some stage, you know, like uh, the Warriors and little campaign medals and things like that. Um, uh, some people do wear hats and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, my, 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 my uh, point with all that is, all right, well, you can continue living in that ecosystem if you want, 
But this is the reason why the enterprise role did what it did, which is basically say, hey, we're going to clearly explicitly write down who's in charge um, because we're working with financial institutions and they want to be able to hold people accountable. So they want to know who to uh, sue effectively if something goes wrong or if there's, they need recourse. And it also impacted how the net network is actually run in the sense that if, if you know who's involved uh, in the network uh, consensus making uh, or the, the block making or whatever it is in, in your chain, um, then you don't need something like proof of work. You know, proof of work was there to basically prevent civils or people, you know, random unknown individuals trying to you know, effectively take over the network by spamming with multiple IDs. I mean, if you, if you go back through, you know, the origination of you know, anti-spam mechanisms and what civil protection is about, well, you don't have that on a network in which you know all the participants because you know who's signing these transactions. Uh, they've been KYC'd or vetted. So you could actually go out and sue them and say, hey, stop. Or you could say, hey, you did this, we're gonna you know, take you to jail, or whatever it might be, because there's usually some contractual obligation. So there's about a dozen of these vendors. Um, if, if listeners are interested, let me just rattle them off real quick. In New York, you have Axoni, Symbiont, DAH, or Digital Asset, um, R3. In London, you have um, Settle, S-E-T-L, uh, .io is the name of the company. Uh, Cobalt DL, uh, Rise Financial, it's R-I-S-E, and Clearmatics, uh, full disclosure, I'm an advisor to both uh, R3 and Clearmatics still. Uh, and then here in the Bay Area, the three that you could probably identify would be um, Chain.com, Ripple, although Ripple's kind of uh, does two different things. They have the whole cryptocurrency that they, they, they promote, the XRP stuff, and then they, but they do have a whole line of products for, for institutions, uh, this Ripple Connect, RC1, RC Cloud, uh, that they've been marketing. Um, which is targeted towards like payments, and then um, Piernova in San Jose, and then there's maybe there's maybe one if you want to add a you know have a you know nice twelve dozen companies um, would be Consensus Enterprise. So Consensus um, is a they call themselves a venture studio. They invest in many different subsidiaries, and one of the subsidiaries is called Enterprise, and they work on and uh, a fork of Ethereum called or a clone of Ethereum called Quorum. It's a instance built and maintained by the folks at JP Morgan. So anyways, if you look at those 12 guys, those 12 vendors as a whole, what, what they've done differently than what the cryptocurrency community did is they, they identify who the participants are. Um, they build out SLAs, end user license agreements, terms of service, uh, basically contracts that keep people uh, on the straight and narrow. And if there's anything that ever goes wrong, then ultimately you're backstopped by courts. So basically they integrate the existing legal system into the infrastructure, or at least that's the goal. And again, I'm not endorsing platforms and we could talk about you know enterprise stuff at some other stage if you want but um the governance they could have some governance issues in the sense that you could have banks disappear so then you have to come up with or, or participants like insurance companies disappear or come online how do you add them and how do you move them from the network how do you make it such that if if they send a trade that they didn't mean to send that you could roll that back have that canceled so all the same things that you have in a traditional network you still have to think about uh, but in this case um it's new and there isn't a specific you know blueprint for how to build a you know, governance around distributed ledgers uh there's been a lot of attempts and discussions about that uh at least formalized i'm happy again to talk about it at some other stage but yeah so that the, the point of the talk was explaining the cryptocurrency world the the lessons that we've learned so far and then saying hey this is how the enterprise world's kind of learned from those mistakes and errors and challenges to make it more transparent for all the stakeholders. Um, and obviously that's not gonna convince, you know, the cryptocurrency folks to not do what they do. And I'm not trying to do that. I think the two worlds can coexist. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, institutions, they might buy cryptocurrencies to trade them, but to use them as actual infrastructure, it's probably, I'm not gonna say it won't ever happen, but if the institution say, I'll give you an example. They, uh, they issue an instrument that has a 30 year maturity or they create an instrument that has you know, a 20 year maturity. If, if they put that on a chain that lives on you know, Ethereum chain, you know, if, if there's another fork and that instrument is put on, unfortunately, the deprecated chain or the one that has the minority chain that's no longer supported, um, who's at fault there? Is it the miner that actually created the block that created the fork? Is it the developers who made the contract in the first place? Is it the institution that backed it? So um, these are all kind of thorny issues that nobody's really uh, had to see for the first hand. Um, we see that now with CME. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Actually, I want to talk about the CME real quick. Um, but did you have any questions before I did that? No, these are all valid points. Accountability. Uh, there's a quote from Newsroom. Um, I don't know if you remember that show, but 
he actually said something about accountability. And it's, I know it's the show writer. It's all about um, the reason why movements work, right? Or anything works in the world um, is because there's accountability, right? And accountability means it's legitimate and you have someone who is then gonna at least make sure that things get executed correctly. And that's, yeah, that's good. my argument to make with uh, Bitcoin stuff, right? It's like Ethereum maybe is great, but then poor Vitalik is sitting here probably with a migraine because he's like the point person for any kind of <laughs> However, <laughs> you go ahead, please talk about, um, you know. Yeah, the CME um, ties in exactly with what you're talking about, the accountability angle and, you know, Who's, who's in charge? So uh, the CME never weighed in on the block size debate, but they unintentionally did. Um, so what, what ended up happening, and I have a, a new draft of an article I'll be publishing really soon about this. Uh, again, I'm not set, trying to take sides, but so you have Bitcoin Core uh, lobbied exchanges, as did you know Bitcoin Unlimited and Cash and all these other guys to have a certain ticker uh, represent their fork. And if you, if you look, Bitfinex, for example, uh, explicitly said it doesn't matter what kind of hash rate or difficulty or any of that stuff that uh, a f one fork has, we're always going to call the Bitcoin core managed chain BTC. So anyone that wants to trade BTC will be always be based off of that chain. Bitrix said something very similar. Um, and then... But neither of those are constituent parts of the CME price index. So for those who don't know, CME is a large uh, exchange called the Chicago, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. They're known for trading commodities. They've announced that they're going to list a futures product starting next month, uh, potentially. Um, and there's price, reference price data that uh, gives that instrument its effectively its price, how much it's worth. And um, initially, when they announced this a year ago, it had six exchanges that comprised this, um, kind of like the Wink Dex did for the coin ETF. Um, and uh, that the, the six ended up getting narrowed down to four recently, and they removed uh, Bitfinex and OKCoin. OKCoin, probably because of the China, you know, uh, regs regarding banning uh, spot prices. There's, there's no spot exchange in China right now the trades RMB to cryptocurrency at this in November. Then maybe that changes again in the future. But so they removed that in, uh, in, uh, from the index and then they also removed Bitfinex. And I assume, it's, they, they didn't announce anything, but I assume it's because of the, the various red flags that have come up in the last few months. Uh, people have known about it for a couple of years, but specifically around the transparency of things like Tether. But bottom line is, is if you look at the four remaining exchanges, three of them did not publicly say anything about the four. Uh, so it was like ItBit, Kraken, and Bitstamp didn't really say anything specifically about the SegWit fork. They've previously talked about others, but Coinbase did. Coinbase said, uh, you know, what, what they're going to recognize as, you know, Bitcoin and what they, what they were going to list as whatever the other would be. Um, and so th this is the challenge for CME and other institutions. If you have a weighted index off of exchanges, even if you call them regulated, but most of them aren't anyways, um, if they don't all agree on what the BTC sticker ticker is, then you could have, I don't want to say calamity, but you're going to have price discrepancy uh, because you have two different ecosystems, right? The, if, obviously, if BTC was Bitcoin Cash, um, you know, you, that's a whole different ecosystem than the current you know, Bitcoin Core ecosystem. So, again, I'm not trying to take sides, but what end up CMEs get, end up having to do is they're going to, you know, they're going to have to decide, uh, number one, what those exchanges will be. Are they going to tell those exchanges to call them up and say, hey, you need to support this specific fork. Otherwise, we're going to have to change the contract terms and remove you or something like that. So I think that the institutions, uh, maybe they've been talking about this. Obviously, if you look at the advisors, they have a number of people who are aware of some of these things. But um, yeah, that's to me the accountability. Like, since there is no administrator for a cryptocurrency on purpose, it uh, ends up being shoved on to the exchanges who end up getting to decide, hey, we're going to support this. And if you don't like it, you know, you could shove it. So uh, it ends up happening that you have some now very influential exchanges that are tied into this futures product by a very, very large uh, international exchange, the CME. So, um, you know, maybe the fork debate's over because of that. I'm not saying it is. There's obviously other things to TL and scream about, like transaction fees and things, but maybe they'll fork about but uh, yeah, this is a topic that you and I probably could talk about for ages. I'm sure you get other guests too. So it's not going to end, but uh, I think that uh, for the listeners, yeah, trying to figure out accountability, this is again why enterprise world exists uh, is because they, they realize that somebody's going to get sued. So let's at least put some faces to those names. Well, I mean, even with exchanges right now, each exchange is a different price, right? And it's kind of hard if nobody's actually going to come up and be like, okay, as an industry, we should actually have some like base levels in place or like industry standards right like who are we supposed to actually look at for an uh, accurate price of bitcoin 
you know, and I, I always wonder, like, um, there's so many questions I want to ask you right now, but I know time is limited here. One being, um, if Satoshi were to reveal themselves, what would that do for the ecosystem right now? Um, I like to go uh, to the Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, actually, I don't think it would matter as much. I mean, actually, I think he could get sued. Um, I think it would, all, all, I think there's nothing but downside for him that, or him or her or them at this stage because you could have liability issues saying, okay, if you prove that you created this uh, and you provided evidence that you did so that's definitive, um, then you could have various governments around the world saying, hey, you issued and created a money transmission business without getting a license. Like, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But, you know, there could be upside later on in the sense that if these tokens are worth, your know, coins are worth a ton of money, maybe you could hire the world's you know, best lawyers and, and fight this. And, you know, like, you, obviously you, you hear of all the, those shower, shower thoughts on Reddit, people saying you could buy out banks. And stuff like that. So I, I, don't, I don't think it would dramatically, I mean, obviously each of the camps on the, the Bitcoin fork wanted to rally behind someone they considered to be, you know, the, the rightful heir to, to, to Satoshi. But um, so wh whatever side he decided on, obviously people say, yeah, see, we're the right side. So, I mean, I, I don't see anything but downside for both him and I guess whatever side of the community that doesn't get him. Um, so I, I, I don't know who he is or she is or what, but I just don't see anything but chaos from that, at least in the short run. Well, I, for one, like that you say she also. Why not? And then, um, we never know. But, uh, it, it, well, thanks for answering that question. I think you're right. Although it would be interesting from the accountability standpoint, right? Um, and what they could argue. However, also, there's always the argument of whether or not Bitcoin is actually an asset class in and of itself. Because some people say it's kind of, yes, there's intrinsic value that people are using it. But mostly when we look at ICOs, for instance, um, a lot of the due diligence, really legitimate people are like, is this based on an asset that actually can derive value on its own, right, period? And that's kind of an interesting argument, right? So, I mean, we have a whole, again, all these things are really good, like, individual topics to discuss with. As far as, you know, cryptocurrencies being their own asset class or ICOs being their own asset class. Um, so I, I, all basically based on price, right? And price manipulation and, like, pump and dumps. What? Yeah, so I, so this is one reason why I would argue that cryptocurrencies really aren't a some quote unquote natural asset class. They're a politically defined asset class, in as much as you know the community of you know the fervent community around it defines its consensus on the edges um, from whatever the, the the mining or staking mechanism does uh, internally. So I, I say that all to to, to say that. Um, I don't think that you know Bitcoin is going to go away or Ethereum will go away. They'll, you'll have plenty of fervent people out there trying to promote it, just like a religion. And you have it doesn't matter if Jesus is dead or if he was alive or any of that stuff. You still have people who claim to be following him and they're pushing their own you know, the, the religious assets, as it were. I, I know that I'm going to probably get flamed by everyone at this stage for saying <laughs> making that comparison. Uh, but you take take whatever religious leader or whatever you want you want to have. Um, and that's kind of what Satoshi is, right? He was this guy who, or girl who, who came out of nowhere and disappeared into nowhere. Um, and so for, for me with the, these asset classes, like if, if, you, if you just dive deep into the actual mechanics, how the sausage is made for each of these, I tried to do that with a, a paper I wrote in, in May for um, our company, the R, R3, I wrote about a 50 page paper on ICOs. Um, look back in 2013, 2014 at the promise claims versus how much these things ended up being coming worth. They were all at all time highs then in May. Um, and I'm sure all at all time highs today if I had to look at it again. But almost all the claims that they had made, the, the advertising to market it to, to different, you know, potential retail buyers or developers, whatever, never happened. Like all these like, oh, it's going to do all this in the next two years. It just didn't happen. So obviously that's that's consumer, you know, consumer fraud. You're, you're lying to the potential consumer. So uh, I, I don't know if anyone's ever going to go to the state or the federal agencies that are in charge of consumer financing, uh, the, the CFPB, Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, whatever the, the initials are. I'm not sure if anyone's going to do that, but that's the problem for ICOs is you have a lot of people making claims. They, they get a lot of whales, the well-known whales to promote it during the pre-sale without disclosing the fact that they gave these guys coins at a really good discount, maybe 50, 60, 80. In APAC, I'm hearing of two, 300% uh, discounts. That's basically risk-free investment for these people. They could they buy uh, a couple months later, they could dump it on a secondary market and 
get away with it. So I wouldn't call that an asset. I would just say th these things are just the same, you know, little Ponzi or MLM schemes that we've seen in the past. Uh, it just happens that it's using technology that you and I are, are, are very keen and interested with. Uh, I think cryptocurrencies, ignoring the ICOs, you know, the ERC-20 tokens, the actual tokens that sit on top of other chains, uh, cryptocurrencies themselves, I think, are, I, I made a spectrum, basically, in this, in this paper, saying the most egregious are these ERC-20 tokens that are solely trying to raise capital just to build stuff. Um, that's effectively, it's the same thing with golf courts. Uh, golf courses, effectively, if you, if you try to pre-sell something that's not built uh, and you need to invest in it, then it's, at least in the U.S., something like pre-selling golf courses that aren't built, a membership's there, it's considered a security. If it's built already and you're selling it to somebody, then it's a membership. So it's a little bit different. I know there's nuances. I'm not a lawyer. Go talk to lawyers. But <laughs> with, with, with cryptocurrencies, if you put it out there, if you actually create the chain and it's going, uh, then it's in the eyes of some lawyers, it's considered less egregious. Um, it is, it's created, it has its own utility. That's why you see this discrepancy between utility tokens and security tokens. Again, I'm not going to get into it all, but I, I would say that at least in those cases, you could, you could say, hey, there is some, some, I don't want you to say some tangibles. There's some intangibles that actually do exist that uh, are being built this ecosystem. But I, I still would not necessarily define these things as assets, as as they are, as they are like uh, even domain names, because uh, the domain names truly are scarce. Uh, you would have to literally take over the entire DNS system and the TLD uh, registrars and stuff like that um, to to try and. Like, for example, the most well-known case is sex.com that, that was litigated for about 10 years. Um, and people are actually here in the Bay Area. Uh, and th that's because people sent in phony, they faxed in phony information, I believe, that originally got the, the, the DNS or the, uh, the, the main name um, uh, sent over to the illegitimate owner. And they, they fought it out in court. Can you actually own the, these, uh, these you know, virtual uh, items, whatever we want to call them? So the people have been talking about whether this stuff is property. Um, and uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, for example, Ryan Strauss at Fenwick and West has argued maybe these things aren't property, at least uh, what we, you know, through contractual law. Um, so, it, it, and we see this, I think, with the forks. If if you could convince one community or your, your side of the community to fork a chain, then you don't actually have digital scarcity. If you don't actually have digital scarcity because you could either increase the money supply or you could, you know, decrease the money supply uh, or do something with the money supply, then you know that's an actual, not, not a scarce thing. So that's actually Bitcoin core. If you, if you actually look at the, some of the, the articles on Coindesk in the last say three weeks, four weeks, the, the part of the emphasis, again, I'm not singling out Coindesk or even Bitcoin core, but part of their narrative is, Hey, if, if, if Bitcoin Segwit 2X or Bitcoin cash are considered legitimate chains, then there is no such thing as digital scarcity uh, because we define digital scarcity as one chain, one chain only. So I, I basically, I, I disagree with that point of view because I think that's maximalistic and dogmatic and against the entire views of allowing free entry into a market, uh, just from my own personal views. But um, yeah, so I, I don't think that's a definitive word on what it, if it's an asset or not. I, I don't think it's digital scarcity though, uh, at least in the long run, because anyone, as, as we've seen, can fork a network and change it and build an ecosystem around it. So, and, and therefore, and, and you increase the money supply from that. I mean, you've got 20 days He's sitting there on his show calling Bitcoin cash shitcoin. So, yeah. hey, by the way, I don't own it for the full disclosure. I don't own any cryptocurrencies, but if people want to give them to me, even ones they consider you know bad or crappy or whatever, uh, you know, I'm, I might not build up a, open up a wall immediately, but feel free to send me uh, some of your private keys. That's fine. I think I'm in the same boat of you. We don't really, I don't sit here and buy or trade or sell. I, I'm kind of more like a little bit. On your side here, I think I've always been, which is um, we'll wait and see, right? Like, where do we've seen a lot of coins come and go? We've seen a lot of companies come and go. We've seen exchanges come and go, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens maybe five years from now. I think, and that's when we get to see what the blockchain technologies are going to look like, and like what happens with Bitcoin and what happens with the SEC, and where are they actually going to make a firm stance on, you know. Is everybody going to be in trouble? Uh, who knows? If you, if you don't mind me saying this one last thing before we, we, we both have to go. Yeah. By the way, thank you for having me on the show. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was um, the point you just raised about, you know, businesses that have been tried to build around this technology. Uh, listeners, if you generally try to be an entrepreneur, keep in mind that, you know, if you see this bifurcation as I do, the, the cryptocurrency world being discrete uh, from the enterprise world, again, you could try to build businesses either way. Um, 
but if you if you look at who was funded in 2013 through 2016 on the cryptocurrency side, the, the companies that actually generated revenue are almost all involved in trading. So if you don't want to do stuff with trading, if you if you say like if you want to try to do a tipping business, it's already been tipping to business it's come and gone. Uh, payment processors have struggled. Um, most of those have failed because uh, again, you know, people typically want to hold on to these coins, hoping they appreciate. And they don't typically spend them. I don't want to get into the argument right now about you know, circular flows of income. But bottom line is if you're looking to build businesses, uh, you know, I, I would give the enterprise side a, a definitely a look too, because these people aren't, these platforms don't depend on price appreciation of coins because it typically isn't a coin. Uh, they're actually genuinely just trying to uh, build infrastructure and you can build applications on that. I know that that's going to open up a whole can of worms on the permission versus permissionless, but um, I really appreciate you uh, letting me uh, be on the show. Uh, it's good seeing you again, Tina. Um, good luck with, with all your efforts. Happy to, you know, keep in touch with, uh, with your listeners. And uh, if, uh, <laughs> if, if anyone's interested, I, I write at a, a website called ofnumbers.com. I'm fairly active on Twitter. Uh, the handle is ofnumbers. And hope you guys all have a great afternoon and a great week. Thank you for being here. You're one of the most trusted voices that I know in crypto. So thank you for being you. Thanks. Take care. Cheers. Bye, folks. Bye, folks.